Hi, I'm Seth Andrews. I'm host of TheThinkingAtheist.com. And I took a left at the valley. I know we shouldn't have to scream that we're atheists. You know, we don't have non-astrologers and all that. But with the religious people taking over the world, I mean, we can either speak up or be pushed into a corner. I'm proud of being an atheist, a skeptic, a non-believer, an infidel, a heathen. I call it how I see it. You just call it faith in a substantiated claim that's something to be ashamed. I'm an atheist. Coming at you from City BC, this is Left of the Valley. My name is Kevin, and I tell you, in the dark, it takes several minutes to find the hole and stick it in. Stupid phone charger. Faith in God. Oh my like God. Joining me as usual is a team that notice if it's <laughs> notice it's so hot, the Jehovah's Witnesses have started phoning instead. <laughs> <laughs> She'll take you out either on a date or out with a sniper rifle, Nancy. Oh, well. Yeah, always good to have options. <laughs> she wonders if you say hi to a short person, is it a microwave? <laughs> Christine. I don't get it. No. <laughs> and the cops pulled her over and said papers, and she said scissors, I win, and drove away. <laughs> My smart ass brain would think that, but I don't think I would actually say that. Yeah, that's, well, when you, that's when you got tasers, right? They don't usually say papers. Papers. They say license and registration, please. Thank you for ruining Scissors, the I win. Thank you for ruining the joke. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies, welcome back. How can we ruin one of your... In order for They're not going to ruin. It has to be a <laughs> gun. I don't know. I'm not explaining it anymore. <laughs> oh, critics, you know, critics everywhere, but I come up every week with a couple of jokes like that. Oh, yeah. Every week. I love your jokes, uh, Kevin. Most of them. Most yeah. of them. <laughs> so today we're going to be talking to our old friend Robert Stanley of the Right to Reason podcast, Yay. and we'll be talking about philosophy, but that's going to be in the second half of the show. But first, let's start with a little chit-chat. Okay, did you guys hear, you know you know how cannabis is now legal in Canada, mm-hmm. right? Yes. And when you go online, you have to, you can't just go online and click, you know, buy. You kind of have to prove your age, right? Well, a Canadian kid used fake ID uh, to buy cannabis online. <laughs> but the fake ID was that of Thor Thunder <gasps> Odinson. Fortunately, I am mighty. What? A common Canadian name. <laughs> oh, very. Of 69 Big Hammer Lane in Calgary, oh, Alberta. My. <laughs> with an actual picture of the actor Crim Hemsworth to buy pot online. <laughs> <laughs> What? And the funny thing is about that is the the the, the ID looks like pretty real, right? Yeah, it's it does. Like, like I said, Thor, Thunder, Odin, Sun. <laughs> wow. Which is just fantastic. But the the worst part is, is the uh, the fake ID when you look at the numbers on it was actually expired by two years. So and he's still who makes a fake ID with an expired expired date on it? Who the hell does that? Was the child caught? <laughs> well, yes? yeah, of course. <laughs> but it was just they didn't they didn't reveal <laughs> who the, this this well, kid was. Obviously. But it was just too funny to see that to, to go to the length of making a fake ID, but with an expired date <laughs> on it on top of that. Well, he might have made it a few years ago. <laughs> Maybe, it might have been when made. the first Thor movie came exactly, out. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so I thought it was just funny. Um, nice try, kid. Nice try, yeah. kid. Well, but speaking of marijuana, we might need some. Did you guys hear that the Trump regime said it will bring back the death penalty? Uh, say again, please. Houston, we have a problem. Oh, I uh, hate this so wait, much. They, they, they think they already, I think they already have. I think have. it's pretty much a done deal now. Yeah. For federal crimes. Uh, the most recent one was in 2003. Uh, William Barr, of course, the Attorney General, uh, uh, asked to schedule five executions of death row inmates. Uh-huh. Um, most, most executions are at a state level. Um, and uh, there's still a 29 states that will still execute people. Um, this was uh, held unconstitutional in 1972, but it was uh, reopened in 1988. Um, the funny thing is, is actually about 56% of Americans actually support this. So it's like pretty much down the middle, you know, whether they like it or not. I hate the American, like, um, uh, the judicial prison. system. Yeah, it's so stupid. It's like. They, their whole reason for existing as a um, prison system is just to fuck with people. It's mm. like, 
literally you're not helping anything. No, you're no, not no. helping society. You're not helping the prisoners. You're not. You're not helping the people who work there. Like it's just, it's just a shithole country. <laughs> <laughs> wow, strong words this morning from you. <laughs> but because the, the, the Canadian judicial system is based on rehabilitation. The American system is not based on rehabilitation. It's based we, more on We still on have our punishment. issues up here. Well, it oh, yeah, of course. And it depends on the state, too. Yeah, of Each course, state, that's true, right? Each state is, is different. But between William Barr and Stephen Miller, I don't think you could find two more evil people oh, in it's... government. Could you? I mean, it's just... Well, Mitch McConnell? No. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, that, yeah. that makes it the, tr- the yeah, holy yeah. trinity. The, the, the unholy trinity. trinity. Yeah, for sure. You're for right. Sure. You're you're absolutely right. Yeah. So it's going to be interesting to keep an eye on that. Uh, it seems the Americans are much more prone to uh, support the death penalty than we are up here in Canada. Yeah. It's just it's so frustrating. Cause it's like it costs more, so it's not like you're saving money by killing people. Mm. It it doesn't do any good, and you kill people who are innocent. Yeah. It's like you know people get murdered by the by the American government in prison systems that are 100% innocent. And yeah. it's just, oh, I hate you guys so much. Well, the, 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 it's, the, it's the law and order mentality, yeah. which has been a dog whistle for a lot of different uh, things. But it's been drummed into the the psyche, you know, of the U.S. that you've mm-hmm. got to have strong law and yeah. order or everything will be chaotic. Yeah, so, and of course, let's not go into uh, also yeah. the whole idea that, that a lot of the prison system is a, set, uh, a for-profit model. Oh my well, gosh, yeah. I know, yeah, right? which is like a, a show Ugh. on its own. Let's not open that can of worms, but maybe we'll do that one of these yeah. days. We, we need the table to stay upright today. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, speaking of Mango Mussolini, uh, he spoke in, uh, President Trump spoke in front of the presidential seal that was actually a Damn. parody yeah. <laughs> at so Turning stupid. Point USA Conservative <laughs> Summit. Oh, it's so stupid. <laughs> one of the presidential seals was actually not the actual real seal of the president. Oh, it, so it, stupid. It was, <laughs> it, the, it, the eagle had two heads, which was, of course, like a, it was a reference to the Russian coat of arms, which an eagle has two heads. It held 13 golf clubs instead of arrows and one uh, claw yep. and cash in the other. And <laughs> no top- wonder Donald Trump liked it more than the original. It's well, practically no, it his it, like soul in a picture. Well, it was a, it was a group of uh, Republican youth, and they didn't catch it because. And of course, Trump doesn't know. You know anything? The, the, the seal from you know from an elephant, so he didn't notice it. So it really they got they could get away with it. Yes, and on top of that, instead of having the e pluribus unum, uh, which was the original motto, uh, it said forty five. I believe I'm. I hope I'm saying this right. Forty five is enon titer, which is uh, forty five is a puppet. Yeah. That's what it means. <gasps> Seriously? <laughs> oh my god. Is- it really oh. was a great prank. Could you imagine was, the person yeah. who actually created that and it got through? Well, apparently, yeah. it was just like what? The, apparently, the you interview guys are the guy so who stupid. the guy who did that and he did that a little while back. Um, no, the, the people had no idea how he got there at first, but it seems from the latest report that it was simply a mistake. Yeah, totally. They, they just printed out a seal that they found online. Google, too probably quickly. Google Docs. Yeah. Uh, Google yeah. Image. So somebody did a, a sloppy job of checking the, the work, and yeah. well, <laughs> that's how it, it appeared there. It doesn't help that the American education system is shit, <laughs> so it's not like they're educated in the like how to fact check. Yeah. <laughs> you, you you think you see when you, when you have forty five <laughs> yeah. right there on the title? Uh, so, yeah. Wait a minute, that doesn't because the, the people who are probably doing that they're not taught like it's not something they're familiar with, so they're not <laughs> like wait a second. That is, that's not our, that's not our motto. Something's what? not right here. <laughs> Something's yeah. not right. No, but, but it's, it's a great prank. Yeah. Well, you know, it, is, it gets, is masterful. That is, best that is pro The best people pranking. to do all the jobs. Well, it's, it's pro pranking, but it was not even done as a prank. That's the worst no. part of it. It was pro just like. accidental pranking. Yeah, it was like, yeah, it was just absolutely coincidental. And it was just beautiful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's almost like, don't believe in fate, but it's almost fate. Yeah. <laughs> Last but certainly not least. Um. Do you guys hear that uh, the Canadian honey market, you know, summertime, little mm-hmm. bees buzzing around, is actually infested with fake honey? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay. Apparently, the, there's a lot of honey that comes, uh, and it's actually d- diluted with a cane or rice sugar hmm. or or, uh, or <sighs> corn sugar syrup That's instead. Nice. It's especially when it's important honey from Greece, China, India, mm. Pakistan, and Vietnam. Yeah. 22% of all these honeys were actually found contaminated. 
Wow. So the, the, so the lesson here is keep to local Canadian yep. sources. If you buy new honey, you know, just keep buy Canadian. Really, you want to buy Canadian. And another red flag here is if you see honey and it's a fairly cheap price, that's a red yeah. flag. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think the fake honey has to say from China or... Yeah, well, it'll, yes. it will say it's... No, I mean, and here origin. we are. Why in the world would anybody, you know, even look at another bottle of honey that doesn't have Canada on it? We've got the best in the world. But I guess it's price. Yeah. When people... It's, it, it's, it's the price. So, so you got, yeah. you got to check the price. If you, you've, you, you've seen honey there, it's like, oh, my God, what a fantastic deal on honey. Well, that's a raise an eyebrow right there. Is it like true mm-hmm. honey or is it like just a hybrid weird mixture um just to give you an idea beekeepers need about two dollars a pound when they sell honey to actually make a bit of a bit of a living so it gives you a bit of a template as to to judge if this is actual honey and like i said you go to a farmer's market go to a real you know farmer who's got his little honey bee colony and stuff like that support him or her and that's really the best thing you can do you'll have the best honey ever that's right i think you you got to splurge Every now and then, and real yeah. honey is a way to do it. Yeah, Sorry, all you guys in the U.S. I know you love Vermont honey, and it's good, but we've got a little bit better. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I always, you know, I raise an I think eyebrow. we're slightly biased. Well, whenever you see a big brand of honey, you know, like those honey in those little teddy bear bottles and stuff mm-hmm. like that, that, that's when I raise an eyebrow. Say, yeah, that to me is like, no, no. Yeah. That's not what I want for I used to get honey. the big tubs from Costco. <laughs> uh, see, I'd, I'd be I'd be leery of that too. Oh, they're so good. Yeah, well, maybe you should check the. It, really it, close. It's a it's a, um, not liquid honey. But is, it, is it made in Canada? I actually don't know. Yeah, I haven't got it in years. So. Well, okay. Well, when next time you go to Costco, check that just just for the fun of it. Maybe and you. And it's sort of an aside when you're talking about buy local. It really is fun to go to a a local place where they sell honey and other bee products because there's so many health products that mm-hmm. are there and you learn about the bees and you learn to understand you know why that honey costs a little bit more yeah. you know than the the important stuff so if you have a chance you know go go support your local beekeepers absolutely yeah, we'll be discussing much more of this especially when we have Miriam Hine uh, come and discuss the vanishing mm-hmm. of the bees yeah. that'll be interesting uh, <laughs> I was thinking about this this week because I was driving down the road and I was at the stoplight and this little bee lands on the hood of my truck oh. but it's like it lands it cu- cutely and it just doesn't just land like an insect it's like it lands and fumbles and tumbles and rolls a couple of times oh, it's, like, it's like my god it's like a clumsy bee bees are little <laughs> it's like it's like too heavy with pollen or whatever it's got there and it's taking that's a break so while I'm at the red light but it, yeah that's right it's kind of cute right it's sort of like the insect that just lands normally no yeah. it just bumbles well, bees, around bees and, actually sleep a lot while they're out there they'll sleep in flowers because mm. they get tired. Yeah, um, why not? It's so cute. It's, it's a lot of hard work. Please. So cute and fuzzy. <laughs> All right, my dear Nancy, you got a top ten for us? I do. I have a very timely Ooh, top exciting. ten. Ooh. Consider the, that the weather has been really hot. Oh, at, God, it's global uh, warming. All the place, especially in Europe. Oh, yes. How about we talk about the places most affected by climate change? Ooh. Yeah. Good top ten. And, and some of them may not be on the Your list radar? that you think you'd make up. Well, the first one is China, obviously, because it's a Chinese hoax, right? Well, I, these don't come in any particular order, so we'll see <laughs> where, you know, if, if China makes it. But um, the, the first one on the list, only because it starts with an A, is the Great Barrier Reef. Yeah, oh, of course, Australia. Been? It's mm-hmm. been yeah. devastated. That's yeah. 1,400 Absolutely miles. devastated. And we all know it's off the, the coast of Australia. Largest coral reef system in the world. A lot of marine life and a lot of snorkelers, scuba divers come. But the ocean temperatures have caused yeah. coral bleaching mm-hmm. in, so sad. and that's part of uh, what what the problem is because once it turns white uh, there are mass die-offs that, that happen and then if there's back-to-back bleaching incidents which there were in 2016-17 um, the mortality rates are about 50 percent of whether the coral is so going to survive so sad. you know that's a that's a massive amount of yeah. coral and every all the other little creatures that depend mm-hmm. on, on the coral. So that's not number one, but it's it's all up there. Yeah. Second one, I think, is really surprising, Venice, Italy. Oh. Although oh, at this time with all of the, with yeah. all of the, the heat the, wave. Well, also the rising surprising. water. And the rising water. The people, like, their houses are 
in the water now. <laughs> Has anybody been to Venice? No, I haven't. I have not. No. I, I, just as a side note, I hear that apparently it's... I don't know if it's industrial pollution these days or just something like that, but it's just... Apparently it smells in Venice. Hmm. Yeah. I say it really, really reeks now. That's so sad. That is. Yeah, but it is. It's the rising water. Mm-hmm. That's, that's well, because it's this it should alternate canals. Yeah, and it's sinking. I yeah. mean, the city has been sinking for quite a while. So Venice... Okay, here, take take another spin around the, the globe. Glacier National Park, Montana. Really? Yeah. Well, the glaciers give it away. <laughs> the yeah, yeah. True. yeah, that's a million acres in Montana on the U.S.-Canada border, and they they have like 3.3 million visitors. But mm-hmm. as the temperatures rise, um, the ecosystem, which has hundreds of species of animals and plants, they're losing one of their main attractions, which is the glaciers. Mm-hmm. They give it its name. It is it is gorgeous. Oh, I know. I've actually been there. Have you? Did you go yeah. on the going? to the sun highway um i That's went to amazing. the very i went to the very the peak yeah yeah, yeah. it is it's beautiful gorgeous the terrifying lakes. drive because yeah. you're like winding around the mountain while yeah. there's construction <laughs> yeah oh, God. there are um 39 different glaciers in the park and the worst um of which have seen reductions of up to 85 percent wow. that surprised wow. me yeah and it doesn't show any sign of, well, of slowing down. Yeah. But it is, it's a beautiful... It's probably just going to speed up now. Yeah, I wonder if they're going to call it Desert National Park, well, Montana. Well, you know what? Scientists lately have said, you know, we need to stop saying climate change, and now we have to say climate crisis. Oh, totally. And, and I've I, actually I heard a lot of people saying that now. Yeah. Because yeah. it is. It is a crisis. Yeah, it is. Yeah. We've, we've surpassed the point of just change. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's become to a point now that, you know, if we don't get a handle on this, you have to bear in mind that one of the things that might kill me as a person later on in my life will be a heat stroke. Yep. Because I can't tolerate heat all that much. So. Mm-hmm. And the Trump administration, in its wisdom, uh, the um, USDA, which has most of the climate change uh, scientists, Son- Sonny Perdue, the, mm-hmm. the guy who said he's decided to move the office to um, Kansas City. It is specifically to prevent most of the scientists yeah, from, from moving. From with moving. Yeah. So while so all this stupid. is going on, you know, oh. the Trump administration is doing everything to go, what? What, what climate change? There's, it's all a hoax. Yeah. Anyway, let's not get into that. The uh, next yeah, one, I know, next right? One, okay, here we go. The Dead Sea. Yeah. Yeah. It's it shrinking to about yeah. four feet a year. It's wow. already lost Four feet a, a year? Third. It's insane. Yeah, it, it's already lost a third of its surface area. Wow. Yeah, and the sinkholes are appearing where the water, you know, has receded. Can Jesus mm-hmm. do something? Sprinkle yeah, some, I know, right? Sprinkle some Jesus dust and make it come back. Pardon? Can yeah. Jesus come in and sprinkle some Jesus dust and I, make it come back or something? Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll try. We'll get on that. We'll, we'll, try. Yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll just phone him up. Be like, hey, maybe the swishy, we'll just call Jonathan. Gee, maybe the swishy lady. <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> yes. We we ought to be able to contact her. I bet she'll help. <laughs> anyway, so the Dead Sea, um, the Amazon. Oh, yeah. yeah. And that, that the is the most devastating on one for our planet. 40% of yep. South America. Well, one of them. Thanks, guys. Yeah, and um, all of the, you know, the ecosystem and all of the mm-hmm. the plant the, the, the plant life, the animals are all uh, really having having a problem because it's become very, very, very fragile. Mm-hmm. They've got extreme drought. Um, and so the, a lot of the tree species um, are no longer there mm-hmm. drawing up. And the, fact that they, and the fact that they elected a president that is kind of Trump-esque uh, as well yeah. in Brazil doesn't help. Yeah, right now, NASA says that the Amazon trees will start to die if the area's dry season lasts longer than five to seven months. And so they're just a couple of weeks shy of that. Wow. So, so people are keeping, a, keeping an eye on it. And here's, here's one that surprised me. The Yamal Peninsula in Russia. Okay. Who would have thought? Oh, yeah, no, I could totally see that. That's where they have the, rain, where they have the reindeer herding yeah. um, tribes okay, that okay. are up there uh, in northwest Siberia. They, reali- they were realigned by climate change. And uh, as the permafrost melts, yeah. the weather becomes unpredictable and the winter mm. season shortens. So in yeah. 2013, they had unusually warm weather that brought rain to the peninsula and then it froze and then they had a thick layer of ice and the 
reindeer couldn't dig through to find enough food. Mm -hmm. So um, sometimes you think about the Amazon as being most effective, but mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. remote yeah. areas up in Siberia are too. Um, in the Indian Ocean, the Maldives, that's made yeah. up of a series of eight atolls. Is it atolls or atolls? Oh, never mind. Anyway, ring-shaped islands formed from coral. Another situation with the with the coral. Year-round temperatures range from 81 to 84, um, which is uh, you know pretty good uh, normally, but it's. Um, uh, van, it's now the temperatures are rising, mm -hmm. so it's becoming a fragile area. Isn't, isn't the Maldives where they erected these uh, these statues? It looks like like a like a, a conference room, and you have a whole bunch of people statues around a table, but it's like halfway submerged. Yeah, um, yeah, I think so. It was, it, wait, isn't that Easter Island? No, 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 it, it, it was it was done just as as a point to the rest of the world. Said, look, oh, we're yeah. sinking Recent here. Thing. They are they're <laughs> sinking. Yeah, they, because it's, yeah, okay, I think the water I know level which one you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, you're right. It is the most low. It's the lowest lying. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so country yeah. in the world. I also think that I think the president also held a uh, council uh, session actually underwater with his staff one time. Hmm. Just to, just to drive the point home. Yeah. It's like, hmm. you know, this is what's happening in the future of our country. Yep. Yeah. It's like wow. Yep. Their country <laughs> will literally not be there anymore. Exactly. Okay. So coming back to this part of the world, Key West, um, it used to be a great sun-soaked paradise, home to Ernest Hemingway, uh, known for pastel-colored buildings, lovely place mm -hmm. to be. Um, but. Uh, even before Hurricane Irma, they were having some uh, some problems. It's the southernmost city in the U.S., and it has a lot of environmental mm -hmm. um, problems. Mm -hmm. So we've got to keep an eye on, on what's happening, you know, close close to home on this side yeah. of the world. So they think that the Corps, uh, Army Corps of Engineer thinks that the sea level will rise 15 inches over the next 30 years. 15 inches? And then, yeah. And then the flooding is going to uh, finally, you know, really be yep. be a problem. This is one thing that puzzles me about, about the uh, American neighbors. They love their military. Their military is basically saying climate change is a problem, yet they're not listening to their own military. Why is that? I don't understand that. Because they don't listen to anybody? No, but they love their military. They love to listen to their military. They love their, 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 their soldiers, and, you know, with good reasons, yeah, right? But you would think... You know, if the Pentagon would step up and basically say, yeah, this is a huge problem, and they, they have, yet the politicians, deaf ears. I, 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 I don't know. I know the Army Corps of Engineers has done an awful lot, some counter, some things that are well, controversial. The, the Pentagon has come out with reports but, saying, yeah. because of climate change, our costs are going to go boom, 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 substantially up. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah, okay, so what? So you think? Well, especially in this administration, they'd rather spend the money, you know, sending troops to the border to yeah. make life miserable for migrants rather than do anything, you know, constructive mm -hmm. about climate change, which doesn't exist, you know. Yeah, of course. So I I fun. think a, a pivotal reason why a lot of Republicans aren't dealing with it is their support comes from evangelical Christians. Mm -hmm. And evangelical Christians don't think the world will ever flood again. No, oh, yeah, of course. You and, think, think God's protected. Well, exactly. And their whole mentality is, like, the end of the world's coming soon. So, like, they don't really think about the world surviving anyways. Yeah. And they're ridiculously, like, excited for that. <laughs> and they also, they also think that the world will never flood again. So when people are like, the world is flooding... <laughs> Uh, okay, we got there, two yeah. more. Yeah, got two more to go. The Rhone Valley in France. Oh yes. And that's like 120 miles, and and people love to go there because of the the wine, you know, mm -hmm. the, the grapes there. But the um, as, as the temperatures are rising, it's becoming more inhospitable to grape vines. Yep. And so if they shrivel, that's like uh, um, the winemakers will be forced to relocate. To cooler locate, which isn't easy to do. No, no. it's no. the soil in the Rhone district that makes a big difference. Yeah. You can't, you know, it's hard. You can't move the soil. It. Yeah, yeah. You got to package the all these grape individually with a little yeah. luggage yeah. and everything. It's it's Tough. so crazy when you think about what the world's going to be like in thirty years. Yeah. Like, climate refugees are going to be a real. Well, thing. and just think of the little things like wine is going to be scarce. It's going to be sad because like where like there's going to be nowhere that's going to be able to grow it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Last one, Mumbai, India. Wow. Yeah. Again, rising water 
um, Probably could lead to parts of the city underwater in future decades. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, they say it's really a likely income. Um, they've had a two inch, oh, at this point, even a two inch rise between now and 2050 would leave the city prone to frequent flooding. Wow. So mostly wow. it's. It's, uh, you know, a lot mm -hmm. of flooding. Also, also, I know um, the rising heat in India has caused yeah, so isn't many Mumbai deaths. Yeah, is Mumbai incredibly, incredibly humid, too? Humid, uh, oh, yeah. 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 The yeah. heat. So, yeah, the heat is, it would just be, mm -hmm. my God, if you get like 100% humidity and you get 40 degrees, you're not, you can't sweat, you can't cool down. It's like, Some places it's uh, been above 40. Yeah. Yeah. It's disgusting. Yeah, it's like when it's like, I, was, I said a couple of weeks ago, I read like it was like 52 degrees in, in Kuwait, in the shade. Oh, oh. It's like, what do you do? You can literally do nothing. No, yeah. No. You have to. You have to wait for cooler temperatures. It's like, wow. Well, mm -hmm. If you step into the sun, you just bake alive. We're gonna start doing things at night and like spending the daytime underground. Yeah. We'll become the mole people. Yeah, right. <laughs> mole people. <laughs> oh. Just, just uh. remember. You guys in the U.S. 2020. Yeah, vote, guys. <laughs> Get your stinking stamps. <laughs> <sighs> oh, boy. You guys are going home against our American friends today. <laughs> this is big time. <laughs> All right. I'm just fed up. Well, okay. on this particular okay, that's, that's topic, they're a little bit stupid about it. Well, you know, yeah. yeah but to be we're, fair, we're not Canada, doing a whole lot better Canada on the climate shit, we are horrible. Yeah. Yes. As a whole, yes. individually, Canadians are pretty decent. But as a whole, Canada... So bad. We suck. Yeah. We are okay. horrible. Let's get our shit right. together, guys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm going to have to find out what country is doing the best in terms of really trying. That would be an interesting. Yeah, I'll have to. What's the greenest country yeah. in the world? Yeah. Top 10? Yeah. That's yeah. interesting. Interesting. I, I know the one that's made the most improvement is China. Like, yeah. they, they have been seriously trying to improve yeah. on an impactful level. I think it's because mm -hmm. they realize there's a big fucking problem. Well, well yeah. When you go into a city, you have to put a mask on because you can't breathe the exactly. air. Exactly. You know there's something wrong. It's becoming a bit of a problem. Mm -hmm. All right, my dear Kirsten, you got another brilliant moment for us? I do. Brought to you by religion. So, this isn't going to be as happy and hilarious as some of my other uh, moments. I don't want to hear that. No, just kidding. <laughs> We're just doing a depressing show today, guys. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> um, so this is kind of like I'm just getting tired of seeing these. So late Monday night in Louisiana, 18-year-old Jack Jordan drove 90 miles per hour straight into an oncoming vehicle driven by 51-year-old Stephanie Payne. The speed limit was 45 miles per hour. 90 miles per hour. 90 miles per hour. I'm trying to think what, ca that, what K that would be. That's close to 160. Woo! She died. He did not. Wow. Mr. Jordan stated that God instructed him to kill himself. Therefore, he accelerated his vehicle to purposely strike another vehicle to end his hit life. Hit a tree. His arrest report says. Just hit a tree. Jordan was arrested on second degree murder for the death of pain, as well as reckless operation of a vehicle and simple escape. State police say there's no evidence of mental illness or alcohol. If yeah, that's true... He said God right off the bat. Um, also, he's suicidal. If that's true, then it means Jordan sincerely believed that God was sending him a message urging suicide, and he ended up taking someone else's life instead. It's faith-based homicide. Faith-based faith homicide? It's bad enough that he had a personal death wish. It's downright infuri infuriating that he was so selfish that he took someone else's life as well. No. Yeah. I'm not reading this because it stands out as something that's overly shocking, I'm reading it because it doesn't stand out. That's a good point. It doesn't stand out at all. I'm not saying every person that practices one religion or another is doing shit like this, but I have seen so many stories like this one where God has told someone to kill their wife, kill their kids, kill themselves, or like in this case, somebody he didn't even know was killed. All the usually fix some stupid little problem like, oh, they're gay or you're saving them. Yeah. And it's terrifying that people would rather listen to some mystical being in the sky rather than think for themselves mm -hmm. and it's dangerous that they see nothing wrong with it because god told them so 
Yeah. Well, the, the, one of the shocking things in there is the sentence, there was no evidence of mental illness or alcohol. What, what do you need for evidence other than this guy's totally wacko yeah. behavior? And it must have been noticed somewhere, but nobody put the, nobody, you know. And the thing about the that is, together. that particular sentence shows up and I think every one of these yeah. stories I've read. Yeah, that's why it's terrifying. There's no evidence of mental illness or alcohol. The, the funny thing is... What do they mean by evidence? At what point are we going to reach the point where this yeah. is their fucking evidence? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and I, I totally agree. And it's, it's interesting that these people would do these things to begin with, but I think what's even more interesting is how they don't question it. Because I'm sure somewhere in the back of your mind, somewhere there's something that goes off that says, uh, should I do that? But then religion comes in and says, who, who, what do you know? You just gonna you just gonna go against God, the perfect, almighty, all knowing being? What do you know, right? Exactly. So it's, it's so it's it's not just pushing you to do something stupid. It's reinforcing the fact that you shouldn't question it either. No matter no matter how much your instinct would probably kick in and say, ah, uh, we all have that innate instinct to survive. Mm-hmm. But your instinct, would, the, the religion was going to kick in and say, no, nope, no. Nope. Overriding. Oh, yeah, override the instinct because God. Yeah. And in some of these it's people, sad. the fact that there, that there could have been mental illness first and that mental illness took the um, appearance of, you know, of religion, you know, and, and God so that it couldn't, it, it's possible that it wasn't the religion, but it was the mental illness using that, mm-hmm. you know, in order to, to uh, justify the voices and justify, but, you know, to give some uh, persona yeah. to, the, to the voices in their head. But even so, it's it, the relig- religious people should be more aware of what's happening to people in their flock and you know, and, and help them before it gets that extreme. But that's wishful thinking. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I just had to share that because I'm just getting so tired of seeing yeah. stories like this. Yeah. The, the worst part is we have these stories every week. Yeah. Right? It's like all over the place. And, you know, we we could actually, if we wanted to, we could just turn left of the valley and do nothing but another brilliant moment oh, all the absolutely. time. There's just, yeah. Stories like that, four or five of them every week. And we could spend a whole show just discussing these stories one at a time. But I think it would just, you know... <laughs> Make us suicidal after a while. It was. Jesus I'm Christ. already there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, perfect. Well, thank you so much, Kirsten. So Welcome. let's take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll be discussing Philosophy 101 with our friend ooh, Robert Stanley ooh. of the Right to Reason podcast. So stay with us. What's up, heathens? I'm the Godless Engineer, and it would be great if you could join me on my YouTube channel. Over there, we post videos every day. On Mondays, we normally post a response video of some kind. Tuesdays, we post our daily Bible podcasts that I record with KC. Wednesdays, we read comments. Thursdays and Fridays is conspiracy theory and flat earth stuff. And we have a new segment that runs Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays that is Today I Learned from KC. Hi, y'all. So please join us over on the YouTube channel, Godless Engineer, where we always stand up and use our voice. In a world torn apart by a lack of reason... And I think it should be religion treated with ridicule and hatred and contempt. And I claim that right. In the morning. Hi, everybody. This is Robert Stanley from the Right to Reason podcast. And if you subscribe now, you'll get free. Learn more about the broadcast at therighttoreason.com. And I know what he says in his book. 
I have access to a higher authority. Now, what I want you, I'll ask, how does he know that? And by what right does he claim to know the mind of God? And if you were a serious spiritual person, wouldn't you think it was a bit much that someone said? They could come before you and tell you what God wanted? guest is our returning champ. He is the host of the Right to Reason podcast. He's a snappy dresser and a snazzy dancer. Robert Stanley, thank you so much for joining us. So happy to be here, Kev. And I, I really, love this show. I love I love being on this show. I really it's appreciate it. Like, I listen to you all the time and to uh, like, hear my own voice coming back at me. And the next time that another show airs is kind of cool. <laughs> and I really appreciate that you put on pants this time. I really, really appreciate that. And I think our audience yeah, well, that too. Yeah, well, I want to mix it up. Okay. <laughs> now, Robert, between before we start this, Philosophy 101, as we agreed, okay, we agreed, I agreed that I would bring you on the show to discuss Philosophy 101, and in exchange, you will stop sending me those dick pics, right? I cannot <laughs> confirm or deny that agreement. <laughs> no, I'm just it's kidding, just, of course. It's just, I feel like when you when you send me back the Facebook, like, laughy emoji <laughs> after a dick pic, I feel like it's not like you're mocking me. You're like, ha, 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 nice dick pic. Okay, it's an I invitation for more. I get that. I get that. <laughs> yeah, that might be an error on my end, misunderstanding, but... It, it's it's a boost of confidence every time that you laugh at it. That's important. That's very important. <laughs> Robert, for our audience, I might not, uh, although we love having you on board and we love having you on a, on a regular basis, for those of us that might not have heard you the first couple of times you were on the show, maybe you'd be what? surprised. Well, I know. It, it happens. It happens. It's unlikely. It's unlikely, but for Who the... Who are these listeners? Well, we've, it's a new listener, maybe. Maybe a new listener that All hasn't right. heard maybe you, Robert Stanley, or the fantastic show that you do. Maybe you'd be so kind to give us a quick bio. Uh, yeah, it's just a conversation, basically, uh, and it's been recorded. And there's going to be fundamentalists. There's going to be, you know, the nice version of Christianity, the the mean version, the the anti LGBTQ version, the the Muslim, the conspiracy theorist. Um, every once in a while, we might bring on a, a, a astrophysicist or a nuclear physicist, or you know, if if we get somebody that's kind of a little crazy. Like, uh, there was a recent one where we had a conspiracy theorist that says, all history is fake. Oh, you yes. can't trust any of the history books. And then we bring on an anthropologist and a historian to talk to him. Uh, so that's kind of that's kind of the whole point of the show. The right to reason is literally what it sounds. You have this right. You can reason this stuff out. But I'm trying to present uh, conversations from people that are at least studied and experienced in these topics so that they can give you the best information available uh, that they can provide. And you can find all of that at the right to reason dot com. It's a fantastic show. I highly, highly recommend it. One of my favorite by far. And I think your show is vastly superior to ours <laughs> right off the bat. Oh. I, I listen to it every well, week. Absolutely. I never miss it. It's not it's not it doesn't have the like the the platform that yours does where you've got a whole bunch of different people talking together and laughing together. So it's like a friends cool club thing yeah. that you do. I don't do that. You know, I just have like me and one other person or me moderating two other people or, you know, three or four other people. But I, I love your show, man. Oh, well, flattery will get you everything. <laughs> okay, Robert, today we are discussing philosophy 101. And let me ask you right off the bat. Do we need to do this? Do we really need to study philosophy today? Well, you can't really do anything uh, as far as science or or trying to understand the reality around you without asking the question, what is it that you're really trying to understand? What is reality? What is the consciousness with which you perceive reality through? Mm -hmm. Why do you have this consciousness? These, these are quintessential questions that I feel like if you're really being a, a materialistic kind of person and just looking at atoms and, and, and periodic tables and things like that, you're missing the, the emphasis behind it, the reason behind it, the heart of it. And at some point, no matter what uh, 
topic of scientific discovery or, or whether you're an atheist or an agnostic or at any point along the way, you either have already, are currently going through or will experience this kind of uh, problem mm -hmm. where you say, what's the meaning of the thing that I'm investigating? Why is this important? And that's what philosophy provides us. Yeah. You know, philosophy was a very popular thing to do a long, long time ago. Do you really think that it's still needed as much today to guide us with all the advancement in technology, ethics, and uh, understanding of social science that we have today? Yeah, I do. And, and here's why. What if I were to tell you that every single thing, whether it's a scientific fact, a mathematical theorem, or how you communicate this via language, is actually just a system of truth. It's not literal truth. In the same way, Kevin, if, if you and I were sitting across a table from one another, a nice round wooden table, like you might sit at a, at a bar, for instance, mm -hmm. and I place a red apple in the center of that table, and I'm on one end of the table, you're on the other, right? 180 degrees apart. We're both looking at the same red apple, but neither of us are actually experiencing the apple. What we're experiencing are the electromagnetic waves coming back to us in the form of both a particle and a wave. Uh -huh. We're interpreting the color the best that we can. And by the way, your red might not be my red, but we at least can agree that red is different from blue or green or yellow. Uh -huh. But all along that time, that apple is upside down as far as our, our, uh, our, our eyes can understand them. And our brain is taking that image that our eyes are perceiving and reinterpreting that to us, which by the way, what the hell is us? Is there really a self? All these things start to come into play. All these questions, these very important quintessential questions of existence. And we start to realize you don't even see that apple. You don't. And in and, and, and the sense of the word see, that's just a way that we describe the phenomena that is occurring when you open your eyes. When you close them, your eyes are still on. You're seeing darkness. You never stop seeing. But you never really see the apple either. And guess what? I'm on the other side of that table. I don't see that apple either, right? Uh -huh. But at least we can communicate together and we can both talk in a form of a system that we can interpret the reality that's existing between us, that red apple. But neither of us are literally experiencing what it is to be an apple, right? Neither of us are able to confirm that the other person that confirms the apple is red even has consciousness. You could be uh, artificial intelligence, right, from any, any sci-fi film that we look at, mm -hmm. acting like you're a human, but not, not literally being conscious. And this is where things get a little weird because there's really no way to know – that you're not the only mind around. We can confirm it with others. But the way that we do that is through also another system. All these things are systems. And this is the concept that was provided to us by postmodernism, mm -hmm. the latest of all the f philosophies that we're going to talk about today. And we'll get back to that. But that's why I say, yeah, it still is significant right now because we don't even know if what we think is real is real yeah but okay well to, to, to take your example of the table and the apple there you, you're describing or you described in, uh, in very good language here the process by which we perceive this apple well that's science that's not philosophy per se is it not okay it's science whenever you talk about the photons bouncing off that apple back to you mm -hmm. but it's philosophy when you say does that actually mean that I see the apple or I see the photon? Mm. Okay. And if, if you're saying, well, the photon is the same as the apple, well, you're right in the middle of an identity problem, my friend, and that's one of the most quintessential issues in philosophy, the concept of what is identity. Mm. Let me ask you this. 
if you take a boat, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Let's just call it uh, a, a ship, as it were. The SS and you Minnow. remove. What's that? The SS Minnow. The SS Minnow. You remove. <laughs> That's an old reference, man. <laughs> over the years, you have to remove all the nails from the ship because the boards start to rot, right? Yeah. And you've you you built this ship with your bare hands, and then your son tries to keep the ship afloat, tries to keep the ship functional, right? Mm -hmm. And then your grandson is is dealing with rotting wood, and he's just working, trying to keep this thing going. Every time something goes wrong, he replaces it with something new. At what point does this ship, and let's not call it the SS Minnow, let's kind of do a little throwback to old school philosophy. Let's call it the ship of Theseus, okay. because that's actually the, uh, the, the analogy that I'm using. The ship of Theseus, Google it. If you're a listener and you're like, eh, that sounds kind of familiar. You're not wrong, kiddo. It is. The ship of Theseus was constantly being repaired over and over and over. And at some point along the way, after every board had been replaced, every nail, every, every design flaw that had existed in generations in the past has been corrected. It might even look a little different. It might even be better. Maybe we put in, uh, instead of sails, we put in an engine, right? Mm -hmm. All these different things are happening. At what point does it cease to be Theseus's ship? When do you call it a different ship? Is it still the ship of Theseus? That's the problem of identity. Fair enough. Although we call it a different ship if Theseus sold the ship to somebody else. <laughs> but until then, it's still a ship if he owns it. Uh, but only because the new owner would rename it. Does really renaming a thing. If renaming that red apple, if you gave it the uh, the Spanish word for apple mm -hmm. or the French word for apple, which I know you're very fluent in French. What is the French word for apple, by the way? Pum. That's weird. But either way, <laughs> just renaming a thing, does that really change its its essential identity? And that's when we have to start thinking, nothing has an essential identity. Things that are existing in the universe simply exist. Even if every human on the planet died and nobody was writing anything down, a rock is still a rock. But what the hell is a rock? Mm -hmm. It's kind of a fascinating idea. In the same way that you might say... Do hippos have history? Well, I'm sure there was a hippo before the current hippo, mm -hmm. right? Genealogically. But what about five generations back? What was the history of a hippo? Well, they don't have a history. This is something that a modern philosopher, Daniel Dennett, touched on, one of the four horsemen. Uh, I know you reference uh, Chris Hitchens a lot. He was mm -hmm. he was part of that group, yes. right? Yes, absolutely. And, and he references, and he says, uh, uh, animals don't have history. Only humans do. Well, that's kind of a mind blow. Well, Wait a minute. I'm not sure that's accurate. I either. thought history existed in the same way that I thought a red apple or the concept thereof existed or the same way that I thought that identity existed. But it doesn't. These are systems with which we interpret reality. Reality is real. But that which we think is reality isn't reality. It's just a system with which we interpret the present. Hmm. Although I'm not sure I would agree with Dennett, because after all, uh, species like elephants are well known to have a collective memory, in a way, right? I mean, some uh, some path to a certain waterhole are passed down from matriarch to daughter, and although the, the, the original matriarch is long gone, uh, whoever's in charge now, the generations down the, down, the, down the lane, they know the exact path nonetheless. So I'm not sure I would agree with Dan on that. But anyway, sure. digressing. That's a fair point. Fair point. Uh, so maybe do maybe hippos do have a history <laughs> that we, we're not aware of. Maybe do do have some collective, uh, some kind of understanding. But you know, here's my problem. I'm pushing back a bit here, Robert. I'm making, making your life hard. Sorry about that. But, oh no, please do, please but, do. What's the point? I mean. Uh, as as a species, as you and I are talking, right, we have a um, working knowledge of the universe. We don't need a precise one. As long as you tell me a rock, 
I have a, a, a fundamental idea what a rock is, and I understand what you're talking about. Do I really need to understand the inner workings of what a rock is to understand the message you're giving me? If you're tossing a rock my way, I know it's hard, I know it's going to hurt me, I know I need to move out of the way. I don't need to philosophize about the atoms of the rock and the composition and the history of the rock. Are we not just complicating our lives with philosophy? We certainly are, but I think lives are pretty complex anyway. Uh, another one of the four horsemen, to keep the atheist theme as it were, mm -hmm. uh, Richard Dawkins described the perspective of a rock from a rabbit, right? Mm -hmm. So he says a rabbit knows that if it's running and it hits a rock, a rock is hard. He, he describes the difference between things kind of in the medium perspective of the universe things in the small which we could understand would be atoms things in the large which might be uh, the andromeda galaxy is going to crash into the milky way pretty soon right and so i mean there's 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 we can we can start to look at things in terms of size in that perspective but when that rabbit if you were actually able to have a conversation with that rabbit and you said do you really need to understand the essence of the rock in the same scientific way that a human does. I mean, come on. Well, what have we done with rocks, right? Mm -hmm. The minerals within rocks we are using for in, in, in our iPhones, right? Or, or our cell phones, where we're able to communicate to one another in, in this wild way that has never existed before. I mean, this is this is bigger than the printing press, my friend. People are talking to one another all across the world right now this has never happened before you're able to reach into your pocket and pull out every bit of the plethora of the knowledge of human understanding and hold it and view it and we use it mostly for porn but regardless <laughs> that rabbit would look at that and go do i really need to understand a rock just try to avoid it when i'm running or else i get a headache to that to that kind of response to us who have that understanding, that would be ridiculous. And I think that's kind of the same way that we might look at somebody that doesn't have the philosophy that we have today. And let's remember, our philosophy is still flawed. We have so much more to understand about the essence of, well, at the risk of redundancy, understanding itself. Mm-hmm. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Uh, the, staying on the atheist team there, I think one of the problems I think a lot of, uh, that, that might turn off a lot of atheists, especially when they have conversation with theists, is philosophy, philosophy seems to offer a refuge for, um, for people to make things vague and to leave, you know, kind of, instead of, you know, yeah. arriving to a conclusion on, uh, on, on, a, on a certain topic, you know, it's, 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 it's a getaway card, you know, it's a get out of jail free. It's, it's that, oh, God works in mysterious ways thing. And that becomes a bit of a problem. And how, how, how would you remedy that? Or can we? Well, we already have that, that really only exists within uh, the colloquial sense that you and I right now, we're, we could goof off and just talk about, you know, what is everything. We, we could pass a joint between us and be like, bro, why do we drive on parkways and park on driveways? Whoa. Whoa. You know, we can do like the little semantic games that we all have gone through in our early 20s at some girlfriend's house. And there's some dude in Birkenstocks that kind of blows your mind about – Freemasons or 9-11 was done by Bush or that, that these are all fun little like mental games but that's just practice for dealing with the pro league right mm -hmm. and there already is a professional league existing in the same way that hard sciences do like chemistry or or uh, engineering mm -hmm. as uh, for instance um, philosophy just like psychology is a soft science but it still falls within the peer-reviewed system and philosophers have been peer-reviewed through the sensory centuries and i would even argue these guys are can i swear can i swear kev no you can't fucking swear on my show these guys are fucking ruthless, man. <laughs> philosophy throughout history, and that's when that's when the history of philosophy 101 gets really fun, is these guys are brutal. They're fucking soldiers, man. They're not like scientists where they're like, oh, you know, I love Einstein. You know, he had a great ass. Get out of here with that bullshit. Philosophers 
destroy each other. Every single time one of them comes out with another book, the guy before him looks like a real dumbass. <laughs> but we still respect him because guess what? We wouldn't have gotten here without them. They inspire the next person. In the same way, like, you can look at uh, hip-hop today, right? Yeah. Uh, you can say, well, these mumble rappers suck. Well, guess what? A couple generations from now, the mumble rappers will be the people that they look back and go, oh, they were pretty good, right? And those new people suck, right? But we're talking about uh, Biggie. We're talking about Tupac, East Coast, West Coast. What's going down? Everybody's shooting each other. They, they redefine things. Aerosmith kicking a wall through, right? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and teaming up with another rapper. It, there was a monumental change in music at that time. And you could use this for any genre of music, right? Yep. Elvis, what did he do with rock and roll? Well, a lot of people say, well, you know, I mean, he stole stuff, man. Right. Mm -hmm. That's a uh, uh, um, cultural appropriation. OK. But yeah, but he certainly changed things. All right. The Beatles. Right. Led Zeppelin. There wouldn't be metal today without him. This is the same kind of theme that philosophy does where it stands on the shoulders of the great person before you. The only difference with philosophy is if Led Zeppelin rocked out the greatest fucking tribute song ever to Elvis mm -hmm. and then said fuck Elvis <laughs> that's what philosophy does it, it really shits on the guy behind you but it uses the guy behind you to get where you are today and that's why I say it's really ruthless and fascinating to look at is it, is it simply ruthlessness or is it just a, an attempt to just get to glory in a way and you're standing on the shoulders of giant while pardon my French are while pissing on the guy underneath you seems to me almost like exactly yeah it's a reach for glory personal glory it's cold it's cold blooded Nietzsche was the best of them in my opinion as far as that that way goes he was the rock star of philosophers but yeah it, it maybe it's a way of looking for glory but who who cares who cares if Bertrand Russell wanted to be the top dog in his department it it at least got us to where we are uh, in the same way like uh, maybe the guy that invented something due to due to the capitalist system that we have um we still have that thing because of him mm -hmm. right if he hadn't done it then we wouldn't have it so maybe the system was a bit greedy but it's working okay so when we're coming to an argument and about trying to make a decision on on, on something here and you're hearing the pros and the cons should we let philosophers really influence us and I, by, by that i mean is should we should we should we take a philosopher's word as as uh, as an argument i mean they're good for making you think about things but can we can we make the argument say well aristotle said that ergo i win the argument should we should we actually go down no. that path no, of course not. That would that would be crazy. And even even if, if we're going to say philosophy is a progression and it's getting better over time, which many would disagree, uh, uh, Jordan Peterson would be a, a modern uh, – he's a psychologist today. He's very popular with the, the right wing uh, um, oh, yeah. YouTube kind of guys as it were. Uh, and he's very anti-postmodernism, but postmodernism – has a lot of things that I think are beneficial. It has a lot of things that are, are apparently flawed. But if, if we're going to say, regardless of whether or not there are flaws with our progress in philosophy, if we're going to say each thing leads to the next thing, we have to remember that it, it's not like a hard science in that regard. And by the way, hard science isn't fucking awesome either. Even if you reference Einstein – or let, let's let's do a better one. Let's use Einstein to combat. Um, uh, 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 who's the gravity guy? Help me out. The gravity guy, the Newton. Newton, right? All right, all right. So so Newton comes up with Newtonian physics, and then if you take his version of gravity, you're coming up short, and Einstein destroyed that. But it doesn't mean that you gain points when you say, "Oh, well, Newton said blah 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 blah." No, we just recognize that someone that made a difference in science said this, right? And it's the same way with, with philosophy, where you'd say, uh, th this is something that you should consider, but let's not make the error of uh, uh, 
appealing to authority, mm-hmm. a logical fallacy. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm just wondering because sometimes it seems to me that, you know, um, take for example, let's, let's take Newton and Einstein. Their work is backed up by data and thus opened up an era in, in, in thinking. But it seems to me when it comes to philosophy that that change has already been made in society and then philosophy mm. is almost a product out of it. You know, it's almost, it's almost like a fashion, right? Oh, it's fashionable to think this philosophy right now. But it, it, did, did, did the, the philosophy come out before or is it simply a product of what we are experiencing right now in society? Well, it's certainly certainly predated science. We, we wouldn't have science without the philosophers that came before it no but, but if i do for philosophy, example postmodernism we're talking about postmodernism we were a few minutes mm-hmm. ago the the, the the philosophy of postmodernism bring the society that is as to the point it is right now or did this the progression of society inform the philosophy of, of postmodernism well both uh, for one thing um the the conversation about uh, trans rights mm-hmm. would not exist today without philosophers like uh, Giles or Deleuze. Um, the idea that maybe there's more than just binary thinking in terms of genders mm-hmm. would not exist today without the philosophy that brought it to the forefront of society's perspective. Uh, so yeah, they they definitely change our perspective. The 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 entire way that we consider free speech or uh, what is true um, these things come from philosophers like Hume um, like Locke mm-hmm. uh, you you wouldn't have any concept of is it better to do this or that from a legalistic sp- standpoint um, the, the litigious concepts of trying to do what's best for the greatest among us, right? Uh, the, the society's ability to say, hey, let's all pay taxes together so that we can all have running water to our house. These concepts would never have existed without utilitarianism or consequentialism or John Seward Mill. So... Okay, so hold on there. Hold on. So you were talking for a, for a second there about transgender people. Are you telling me that you think if it wasn't for philosophy, we never would have had the idea that gender is on a spectrum? You, nobody would have figured out that, you know, yeah, these people are just not just binary? We, we wouldn't, they would still exist, but we wouldn't have a framework, a language with which to interpret this phenomena of human existence. Hmm. So uh, I, I feel like it might be better if if you'll you'll bear with me to kind of do like a quick history, a quick rundown that was of my, how we got here. That was that my next right? question. That was my next question. Actually, just give us a, philo- a philosophy one on one for somebody who wants to get into it. Where do they go? Where do they start? Okay. Well, all right. So before we get to like the timeline, mm-hmm. let's just look at the basics. Okay. There's egoism, utilitarianism, deontology virtue ethics and perfectionism these are the five basics of philosophy that got us to where we are today and those all led up to what what our countries were founded on which by the way you were asking what's the point of philosophy well we wouldn't have the state that we currently exist in today without these five quintessential philosophical concepts egoism It's all about self-development. This is Nietzsche. This is Machiavelli. Utilitarianism, the idea of the utility of what you're doing. You're going to get a lot of that from John Stuart Mill, amongst many others, but he's kind of the the big dog there. Deontology, you're going to get the categorical imperative from someone like Kant. You're going to get the veil of ignorance from someone like Rawls. Mm. Uh, Virtue ethics, it's all about exactly what it says it, it, it to reference your your kind of favorite thing like science cosmology as it were um the uh time of bombardment that was a that was a very clear terminology a very clear category for the time that the earth was being bombarded with all these celestial rocks as it were right that's the that's why the moon has all these potholes in it right mm-hmm. um the, in the same way 
we had these kind of really clear terms throughout philosophy when it comes to virtue ethics. It's all about virtue. These are guys like Plato, Aristotle, a uh, more current one, Mendes. Uh, and then perfectionism. That's that's all about species advancement. This is Nietzsche and Marx. And if everybody's eyes are rolling back in their heads, let's do something a little more fun. Let's talk history, okay? Mm -hmm. So we've got the ancient time, the Hellenistic time. If, if it helps with Hellenistic, just think like medieval, okay? People have got like swords and shields by then, okay? Ancient is like, you know, like the Roman times and well, you've seen the paintings of that, right? They were they were washing their ass with their bare hand back then, but at least they had running water. Yeah, when um, when, when Nancy was born, exactly, and <laughs> and that's when she developed her her Jew killing <laughs> styles that she has today. Uh, after them came the rationalists, the empiricists, and then the big boy Kant. But let, before we get ahead, all right, let's let's go back to the ancients. Mm. This is Plato. This is Aristotle. Okay, so we don't know if Plato existed in the same way we don't really know if Christ existed. He didn't write anything, but things were written about him. Yeah. Socrates wrote about him, and this is the Socratic method. Just the basic concept, and it's very easy for us to like forget that we wouldn't have this now if they didn't do this then. And people, in the same sense of like how I compared it to Jesus – uh, 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 or, or, you know, you could reference Fox's Book of Martyrs of people that followed Christ and died as martyrs. Uh, the, the story of Jesus, whether he existed or not, whether you're a mythicist or not, at least the story of Jesus is that he died for what he believed in. So did Socrates sucking mm. down some hemlock. And all he was trying to put out there was simply the Socratic method, which wasn't just asking questions. That's kind of how we remember it. But it was asking questions no matter what level of class, status, or authority you come from, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this then leads to Aristotle, right? Plato wrote about Socrates, and then Aristotle learned from Plato. Mm -hmm. uh, Plato's remembered for the Republic, the concept of can we create a society that works? And by the way, he said democracy – is the worst idea. Don't do that one, <laughs> which is kind of funny today because we're all pro de democracy. Yeah. But you know, the, once again, these guys aren't freaking geniuses that we, we that we have to regard like uh, uh, some kind of demagogues. But these are people that got us where we are now, and the way that he got us here was to lead to Aristotle, who, by the way, taught Alexander the Great. And Aristotle's big idea, one of his big ideas was the philosopher king, which was if you can teach somebody everything that's available to them, to a little throwback to the big beginning of our conversation where we're saying you can pull out just a little box in your pocket and get all this data, we're all philosopher kings today, mm -hmm. right? But he was saying if you could give some, one person all of this education, right, and then let him lead people, it's almost a belief that Humanity has a, a, a quintessential goodness about it, that it might just work out. It, it has an essence of humanism even back at this time. But Aristotle wanted to focus on something else. He wanted to focus on the concept of eudaimonia, that which brings you the greatest happiness, right? Mm -hmm. This led to the Hellenistic period. People like Augustine or Anselm which really started focusing, and by the way, we said this was medieval, right? Yeah. So this is this is the Crusades. This is Christians versus Muslims. There was a lot of religious problems that were happening at this time. Western philosophy took a hit, my friend. It took a big one. And so all of philosophy started redirecting itself to the concept of what does God want us to do? Yeah. Right? And, and it really, it, you know, it produced some really great stuff. Uh, Occam came from that time. You might, you might remember uh, Occam's razor. Yes. If you're trying to get to an idea, a concept, the thing that gets you there with the least amount of bullshit, let's just cut it down to brass tacks, the least amount of bullshit, the least amount of extra data – is probably the best route to go. It wasn't necessarily a reference to how to access the best truth as much as how to access the best system to get to truth. And we're going to come back to that and not even half a century ago with postmodernism, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. 
after these guys comes the rationalists, mm -hmm. all right? We're talking about Spinoza. A lot of modern Christian fundamentalists really like Spinoza. But he wasn't the leading thinker of the time. The leading thinker of the time was Rene Descartes. Mm -hmm. Rene Descartes, he literally took a table. He <laughs> slid it across the wood floor, knocked everything off of it. He had all his books, all his study stuff. He had a wine glass on it. He didn't care. He wiped the wine off afterwards, right? I don't know how transubstantiation works if you clean up the wine. But either way, <laughs> he cleans off the table and he says, I'm done with all this information. I want to start fresh. And that's a really interesting concept. That's the beginning of skepticism. Mm -hmm. Like we want to say that Socrates started it because he asked questions. But his questions could have been flawed. Somebody that's a flat earther or somebody that believes in uh, – uh, we never really went to the moon. Is, is that really a skeptic? I mean, they're asking questions. Yeah. But are they being skeptical or, or do they kind of have an agenda of saying there are powers that be and that person is responsible for everything? And it almost makes me feel better as a conspiracy theorist to put all of this on someone else, mm -hmm. to believe that there still is someone in control. It makes you feel safer to think that way. Rene Descartes wouldn't even take that. He said, no, I, I am fearless for the truth. Now, you know, once again, this was during the medieval, medieval period, so he didn't have the same cultural advantages that we might have today due to the skepticism that he gave us, right? Mm -hmm. We got to give these, some of these guys a pass. They came up with some dumb stuff, all right? Uh, Socrates was a pedophile. Yeah. Socrates was a pedophile. Right. Let's not just like discount the the wisdom from a person due to the ethics of a person. Right. We have to look at how culturally significant they were at the time and how they produced the facts that we have today. Or maybe not the facts, since we're talking about soft science, but at least the understanding of reality that we have today. Right after that comes the empiricists. Now, these guys were done with playing games, which you would expect after all this God talk, right? Uh, we're done with this, okay? We're done with cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. Get the fuck out of here. Uh, who Who is saying, I think, therefore I am? Mm -hmm. There's a major flaw with this that the, the empiricists recognize. They said, well, you're saying, I think, therefore I am. It, it would be the same way if you wrote any paper in junior high and used the definition of the term to define the term. Yep. Or, or, or the term to define the definition, right? The, the, the teacher immediately would go, hey, you, you can't do that. It doesn't make sense, right? Uh, you're, you're creating um, a self-refuting axiom. You're, you're using the thing to explain your answer as the explanation of the claim. You can't do this. The yep. empiricists were all about, once again, like like uh, times of bombardment from science, right, and with cosmology, they were all about really clear answers. They, they were empiricists, therefore they were all about being empirical. These are guys like Locke or Berkeley or Hume. These are the guys that led to the constitutions and the legislation that we exist on today. So it's getting close, man. It's starting to get real. Mm -hmm. After Locke and Hume comes Kant. That's the big boy. Okay. okay. He comes out with a categorical imperative. He says, let's start looking at ethics from a different perspective. Okay. Let's stop talking about God. Let's stop talking about uh, eudaimonia. Let's stop talking about uh, uh, you know, fucking kids. Let's get down to brass tacks. Let's let's try to figure out what is right and wrong. And Kant said, if somebody comes to your door, Ke Kevin, mm -hmm. he knocks on it. You open the door. He says, "Do you have someone inside your house?" Well, you do, Kevin. Someone just moments before this crazy aggressive dude showed up at your house and knocked on that door and and said do you have someone inside your house some woman ran inside your house and said my husband is a crazy abusive axe murderer he has three people in his backyard please protect me right yeah and you say 
to that person, no, no one is in my home. Please leave. Well, God said you're you're making an ethical error. You're supposed to do the right thing. You're supposed to tell the truth. Whatever it is that you do, this is the categorical imperative. Whatever it is you do should apply to everyone in every situation. Now, there's benefits to this, obviously. Uh, That's why you think you probably shouldn't steal, because if everyone stole, how would we have any form of trade at all? There would be no trust or honesty. As Daniel Dennett would refer to it, you have no contract, right? We all have contracts between one another, whether it deals with trade or with just basic civil conversation. You you enter into a social contract, as it were, right? That's kind of referencing Locke Mm -hmm. a little bit. Mm -hmm. So he's not nuts, but you can see the flaw there, right? If you're a a person in uh, uh, 1930s, late 1930s in Germany, and that Nazi soldier comes up to your house and says, are you hiding Jews in your house? It's probably better to lie, right? It's probably better not to follow the categorical imperative. So so even though Kant broke down some major barriers of just getting to, getting to some real facts about ethics, he made some flaws. And this is when things got crazy. This is post-enlightenment. This is when it got fun, okay? So... Everybody blows up, okay? Mm -hmm. You got the three main people that sprouted off in the early 1900s, all right? One of them doesn't sound like much of a philosopher. He's more of a psychologist. The father of modern psychology, this is Sigmund Freud. Mm -hmm. Another one, Karl Marx. Mm -hmm. And a third, Friedrich Nietzsche. Now, Freud said all of our, and this is basic ethics 101, all of our impulses come from something we're unaware of. He claimed it to be the unconscious. Now, uh, Carl Gustav Jung later described it as the subconscious, a, a term that we use regularly in our vernacular, but he said these are all unconscious, which I think is a better description because you're unconscious of it. You're unaware. The ego, the super ego, the id, these impulses that drive you. And it started to really question these earlier philosophers like Anselm, who would say that uh, there's some kind of divine calling. You have some kind of ethical responsibility for what you do. You have a soul. Well, how can you have the free will of a soul if you're unaware of your own impulses? This blew everybody's mind. So while he's talking psychology, Marx, post-industrialism, comes out with saying, hey, 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 stop everybody. I don't give a fuck about the psychology of it. I'm talking about the class systems, right? Hmm. You have more in common as a Frenchman that's poor with someone from Botswana that's poor. But if France and Botswana go to war, the people that are running that war are the aristocracy. And neither of you have anything in common with your own countrymen that are in a different class. He said it's all about economic class. Mm. That blew everybody's mind. I mean, we, we saw how that led to some very negative effects. Uh, within the Soviet Union, within a lot of uh, uh, South American countries, as it were, well, even I though a lot of that had to do with. But I think we can agree that I think we can agree that the model the USSR did for communism was not really what Marx had in mind. Absolutely, but it was damn sure close. Mm. Marx and Engels did lead to these kinds of tra- tragedies historically, but I don't. I, I would agree with you that they're not necessarily responsible. So that's that's another point to your question of does philosophy matter? Well, yeah, whenever somebody shakes things up, people die, man. That's how powerful philosophy is. It leads to life or it leads to death. Mm. The third guy in this group is Nietzsche. Nietzsche is uh, remembered as saying uh, 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 God's dead, right? We yep. killed him. Yep. And he, he wasn't really trying to say God lived before this he was just saying the concept of god is dead because he said it's not really about god it's about a the uber monk the superman a man that is able 
to not be guided by all these things that are affecting him from his culture, right? The essence of skepticism. Nietzsche took skepticism to a whole nother level. And then B, three things. So so we got A, Ubermunch. Mm -hmm. B, the three categories of being a human, right? Mm -hmm. And and underneath those, if you can kind of think like a, a, a an image, right? Like a, a, a Word document for a moment and say, number one, a camel. Number two, a lion. Number three, a baby. Well, that kind of seems silly to come from like some, oh, is this great philosopher? These are dumb ideas. Well, give me a second. The camel puts all this weight on his back. He's just a worker, right? And don't think of it like a worker, like, oh, I go to my job every day. I, you know, I labor. We, we all go through that. It doesn't mean we're all camels. He's talking about the philosophy of the camel is just being a tool. Mm. We all know that person, right? We probably work with one of them. We might have one in our family or a neighbor or a friend. They just don't think about shit. They have no depth. They're very surface people, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, social media really procreates or, 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 or persists with this, this kind of concept of just giving you fear or excitement or whatever the headline is. Bop, 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 bop. Get you right, right in front of you. And this is all you're thinking about. And you never really read the article. How many fucking people have read the M Mueller report? But they're all ready to say Trump is working for Putin. But they don't they haven't referenced it. They don't dig in. There's a lot of us that haven't dug in. That's what Nietzsche was referring to as the camel. You're just being used. That's all you are. You're a dumb animal and you're being used. He said, there's another stage you get to. Usually comes throughout life, but not everybody. I've I've got people in my family that are major Trump supporters, and not one of them have ever questioned whether or not Trump is a real piece of shit. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So them, they just love them. They love them because they're camels. They're used. They're useful tools. That's what we call it, a tool when we refer to another human being. You you are something to be used by the powers that be. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to be that person. You can graduate to a lion. What's a lion doing? He's stomping his paws through the Sahara, right? Like Mufasa. <laughs> this guy is ready to tackle the problems that are before him. He's done being used, right? But he doesn't really have necessarily like a mind of his own. He's not necessarily fully conscious in the same way like we were referring to, uh, you know, what's the difference between human and animal consciousness, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is a rock conscious? Is a lion uh, uh, experiencing the same level of consciousness mm -hmm. that Kevin Francis is? Of course he's not. But he is experiencing some consciousness, and he is brave, and he is fucking majestic and cool. I want to be the lion more than I want to be the camel. But what follows that? The baby. Now, the baby seems totally vulnerable, and guess what it is? And that's how a lot of us felt to reference atheism. The first time you started doubting your God, mm -hmm. the first time you started questioning uh, your church or your parents or everything that you believed in, whether or not you're you're dirty, you were born broken, you felt like a baby. You were vulnerable. But you know what you were? You were better than the lion, and you were certainly better than the camel. You're not going to be used anymore, and you're not just roaming around the desert alone ready to fight. No, you are vulnerable, and that's beautiful. And that's what relationships are truly based on. Everybody says relationships are based on love and trust. No, relationships are about vulnerability. If you can really give yourself to another person, if you can really give yourself to humanity, you're a humanist. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that we got to get all crazy and say like a, 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 some full sense of complete altruism, right? Mm -hmm. But... Uh, that you know that, that that might not be the best. Let's not go to the extreme. Let's not take the risk of the slippery slope. But to be truly vulnerable means that you actually can be innocent in your perspective of the world. True skepticism. He said the truest skeptic is the baby, and you kind of starting to see a theme throughout all of this of <laughs> questioning reality. It's leading us to the skeptics that we are today. We wouldn't be here without this, right? At the same time that these guys were doing what they were doing, 
John Stuart Mill comes along, big dick John Stuart Mill, and he's swinging it, man. And he's <laughs> he's asking questions that nobody was asking, baby. He's saying, what if a trolley car is flying at you, right? Mm-hmm. And there's one person in front of the track, and you could you could change it, or, or there's one person in front in front of the right track, and it's flying toward the left track, and there's five people on that one, and you got the lever. Are you going to pull that lever and let it go toward the one person, or are you going to let it hit the five people? That's an ethical dilemma, man. A lot of people say hit the first person. But what if you're on top of a bridge and there's a fat guy leaning over top and you don't have the lever? All you have is the fat guy. Are you going to push the fat guy over top and let him land on the track so the trolley car hits the fat guy to save the other person? That's still killing one guy for another per- for the five people. But, oh, my God, that's a lot harder to do. He asked some really hard questions. And he said the, the essence of philosophy of ethics is that we need to focus on – happiness hmm. and not just happiness like oh, i want a blow job or oh i want a chocolate cake slice or slice of chocolate cake he said there's higher levels of happiness right he said that uh socrates depressed is still happier than a pig happy that seems silly but think about it for a second why would that be Why would a happy pig still not reach the same level of higher pleasures through utilitarianism as a depressed Socrates? And he said, because as humans, we're able to reach higher forms of pleasure. The pleasure that we get from justice or from listening to Brahms or Mozart Mm. or from having the conversation that we're having right now, a pig will never have that. Even on his best day of, of fucking other pigs and eating slop and rolling in the mud, he might be really happy, but he can never attain the pleasures that we can right now. And that's something that, that it's not just – man, it's – when you ask about philosophy, it's not just saying like, well, what's better, philosophy or science? But think about this, dude. Mm-hmm. On your lowest day, on your most depressed day – you have something to be grateful for. You have more worth from a utilitarian perspective. John Stuart Mill says you should be grateful for what you have because you're able to at least examine your own life. This blew everybody's mind, right? Mm. And this lasted for a long time. Uh, uh, Rawls came around and said, hey, if we really want to understand ethics we need to look through the veil of ignorance which is another way of saying let's step back all right if you could uh referencing uh bombardment of the moon earlier right yeah let's say we can we can all of us you know you me and a couple philosophers get off of the planet we get on uh, apollo 13 but this one actually lands on the moon right and Tom Hanks is with us and and we're we're sitting there and we say all right how are we going to make the world If we could really do like you're looking at Earth from the moon's perspective, it's beautiful, it's green, it's blue, clouds kind of blowing over it. And you say, what's the best world we could create if we're really going to be in charge? What would we do hypothetically? Rawl says, slide a veil in front of you where whoever goes back. So you got Robert, you got Kevin Francis, and you got Tom Hanks, okay? All three of us have to decide what kind of world we want to create. And I say, well, let's go slavery. I like the idea, uh, you know, if I get back to the earth, I would like to have slaves. But we got the veil of ignorance, which means you're ignorant of what you'll be when you get back. I might be a slave. And and you, Kevin, and, and Tom Hanks correct me, right? And you say, hey, uh, you might just be a slave. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change my, my whole idea, right? I'm going to say, no, 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 no. Uh, if I might be the slave, then I'm not I'm not going to choose a system of slavery, right? And you might say, well, I'd, I would like men to be in charge because I'm a man. And Robert and Tom correct you and go, whoa, hold on, there's the veil of ignorance. You might be a woman. Do you really want to be in a misogynistic culture where, you know, men are dominant and you're the woman? And you say, well, okay, let's, let's, let's really work toward equality, right? Mm. And then Tom says... Uh, you know, 
I really like the idea of being rich. I've been a rich celebrity my whole life. Let's keep the capitalist system that we have, right? Which, by the way, hierarchies financially existed long before capitalism. But that's just an easy reference. So let's go with that. And he says, let's let's keep this financial system that we have. And then Robert and Kevin correct him and go, you might be a poor person. Are you sure you want to exist in a society where the top 1% have as much wealth as the bottom 50 percent and we go oh that's that's not fair at all that's not egalitarian that's not equality let's not do that so it really it really challenged everything even things that we still have today we still haven't recovered from the fireworks that Rawls was shooting out of his ass that guy (laughs) blew everybody's mind right but we weren't done after him came Giles and Deleuze, right, Mm -hmm. and Derrida. And these guys said, I really appreciate these conversations you're having, and the enlightenment was cool, but how do you know what you think is true is true? And that's kind of where we started this conversation, is there are systems of understanding, but you're not really seeing truth. It's, It's not saying that truth isn't there. It's just saying that we can't necessarily access it. And this is the whole essential, fundamental basis for our criminal justice system, both in Canada and America, right? It all came from Jeremy Bentham. He proposed that if you wanted to construct a prison, the best way to do it is to put one guard in the center, right? And then kind of think of like a pentagon, right? Where each each cell is all around him, but the prisoners can't see the person watching them. They can't see the guard, but the guard can see them at his will. That would cause the prisoners to act accordingly, right? The same way we feel like surveilled, right, by cameras all around us today. Mm -hmm. I was talking to somebody recently from South Korea where they said, man, here in America, you guys are in Canada as well. You guys really have a lot of freedom from being surveilled. In South Korea, there's cameras everywhere. It's weird. I mean, crime solved, but also you don't have freedoms. What's more important to you? You know, it's a a hard line to draw. In that same sense, that's what uh, Bentham proposed for criminal justice, is if everybody thinks they're being watched all the time, then they're probably going to be good boys and good little girls all the time. Hmm. Well, postmodernism comes along and says, isn't that kind of what we do today? Think of the social justice warrior on Facebook or Twitter. If you say something as a joke, they post that and repost it and say, hey, everybody, let's jump in here. Let's attack them, right? We all kind of police ourselves. And it's not just on the Internet. We do it in our conversations from one person to another, even in public. And in some ways, this is good. But in a lot of ways, we're policing each other. So even our our way of communication can be questioned but also reality itself. And that's where we are today. We are post post modernist. Hmm. This is where we're at in philosophy today. And it, it, it's exciting to think like, what's the next step? Because the farther we go, the more we start to question everything that occurred before us. Robert, uh, if I may be so bold to a curveball. Do you think these philosophical stances that we have today, which of course seem to define a lot of what we do, um, would we have the same kind of philosophies if our species was not a social species? I mean, if, for example, you had an alien species that would land on Earth, but they're not a social species. They're not, you know, they don't live in groups. They're more like tigers, you know, they're solitary, they're hermits or something like that then would they be able to understand uh, philosophy, the way we look at it? No. Tough question, I know. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to do a different question? <laughs> let's, do, let's do a different one. Let's do a different one. No. Uh, it, unless, unless you don't want to do the editing. But no, no. I, no I, I, I'm without, just... without the level of consciousness or intelligence, of course not. But, but I don't think that would be a fun question. No, I, I'm just I'm just wondering because you know uh, we seem to use philosophy as a template to define our reality, but 
all this basically, like I said, just stands on the idea that we are a social species. Can we, yeah. with, with the template being valid, if we weren't a social species, it probably would be, you know? Yeah, we wouldn't have any way of communicating my ideas to your ideas. Yeah. And without that, just to bring it full circle, you're obviously a professional, you know what you're doing. Uh, we're, <laughs> we go right back to the red apple. You and I are sitting across from that table, across mm-hmm. from one another, yes. looking at that red apple. And that's the essence of who we are, the ability to communicate. And whenever you are describing that red apple to me and I'm describing it to you, I'm, we're, we're confirming one another's analysis. And science wouldn't exist without that. Philosophy sure wouldn't exist without that. Uh, so, yeah, I think at the end of the day, we got to remember that if we stop communicating, it's all over. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's a great way to finish that. Thank you so much, Robert. By the way, there's a worm in that apple, I think. <laughs> I don't see it. <laughs> <laughs> you have to turn. That's, to, you have to see it from my crazy. side. When well, we disagree, but at least see, we can talk it out. Yeah, you have to see it from my side. I'm sitting opposite end of the table to you. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much, Robert. That was great. I think that was a great uh, crash course for philosophy. I actually am gotta admit, I'm I've been more intrigued to the subject now. I'll have to take a closer look into it. So, uh, Robert, uh, before we let you go, uh, if people want to find out more about all your spectacular work and all your fantastic show at the Right to Reason podcast, where can they find you? Patreon.com forward slash right or www.therighttoreason.com. I'm on iTunes, I'm on Stitcher, I'm on YouTube, I'm everywhere. Uh, find it, check it out, uh, subscribe if you're on YouTube. Don't forget to click the bell or you won't mm. get the latest episode. It's a fantastic show. I highly, highly, highly recommend it. Robert, before I let you go, i got to have you say, hey, this is Robert Stanley from the Right to Reason podcast, and I took a left of the valley. This is Robert Stanley from the Right to Reason podcast, and I took a left at the valley. Fantastic. And that was Robert Stanley of The Right to Reason. Love Robert. He's always so interesting. Um, Did did you notice during your interview at any time that there was somebody missing? missing? Yeah. (laughs) There were were a few voices joining in there. We we just don't like philosophy very much. You know, (laughs) as women, we're just like not educated enough to talk about that like that brainy stuff. I told told Robert I was sending you regards and I said, you know, I'm sure the ladies wish they they could be here. Unfortunately, we had a scheduling issue Mm -hmm. and he couldn't quite make the right Right, time. And he said, let's just do an all guy show. The girls won't mind. <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. Okay. You know he's going to listen uh, to this. He's going to feel super bad oh, now. Of course. We, we know who his favorite is. Yeah. <laughs> I still haven't let him down for that hundred, or what was it, like our anniversary show? Yeah. yeah was, Only uh, thank you. I still haven't let him off the hook for that. Robert, I knew that Robert, was going to come up. Don't, don't listen to them. They're just joking. They're just joking, Robert. No, we love you, Robert. I'm not. Even Christina does. <laughs> oh, right. Well, dude, this was very interesting. It was very very, um, it was a, a, a pretty much a crash course on philosophy 101, where you should start and where we are with it. And you know what? I've always been one to say, eh, philosophy, you know, it seems to me almost like a waste. Really? Of, like, yes. To me, because, you know, it's like I, I, I'd rather stick with facts, right? Mm-hmm. But at some point, you know, I, I think philosophy is good to give you an idea as to where to look. Mm-hmm. Totally. But that's about it. But I, I think I, I, at first I thought we were giving it way too much importance. And I also hate the fact that, we, uh, like I asked the question in the interview, as you guys saw, that uh, unfortunately when you're speaking with theists, they take refuge in philosophy because in yeah. a way it is vague. Yep. Right? So yep. They, they, can't, they can't come out with facts. So then their best weapon is to use philosophical argument of this and that. And then it's just a quick little step into the mm-hmm. metaphysical woo yeah. from there. Well, because if you pull out psychology, you're like, this is literally what your brain is doing when you believe in a deity. Yeah. yeah. Like, this is how, when you take new information, your brain is misorganizing <laughs> here's a chart but so like for that if you can't really come back and be like no it's not <laughs> so I think I think I gotta thank Robert for that so I'm gonna take a, a look into philosophy a bit more seriously mm-hmm. well you know it depends on, on who you're talking with if yeah. someone if someone understands their, their topic and they make it interesting you know like Robert well he can make anything interesting yes. you're gonna listen and you're gonna say you know there's some value here but it could be a wonderful topic, and the guy who you're talking to just 
makes it yeah. sound, you know. I think Robert would be a very good teacher yeah. uh, in a class for that because sure. he makes things interesting. Sure. The way he explains it, the way, you know, it's not dry and all. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's, it's, it's Robert. I mean, that's one of the reasons that we love yeah. Robert so much. Yeah. Perfect. Excellent. Well, excellent. That was, that was a good show. I had a lot of fun. It was good to vent my anger at Americans. It was. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much, ladies. I do love you all Americans, though, just so you know. <laughs> all of them. Just, your country as a whole is kind of a shithole. Oh, oh them, really? Like, okay, okay. The comments of uh, Christina Chris- are not necessarily those of Left of the Valleys. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I think, I think a lot of Americans are coming to realize that, that their country isn't, like, the freest nation on the planet. Well, you know, it may... It, okay. Kevin's just like, I'm trying okay. to end the okay. show. Uh, yeah, okay, okay, okay. Can I finish the show now as a point? No. If you, want, if, you need, if you need to get something out, get it down now. What was uh, here? Oh, that is so loud. That scared me so bad. There's okay, nothing, quick, now. Yeah, there's nothing like ending a show myself. on a whole new topic that I we want to talk about. I so bad. What do you mean you scared yourself? It was really loud. She spoke too loudly into the mic. She wasn't expecting to be that close. My eyes were closed. Guys, we're trying to throw some semblance of professionalism here. No, we're not. <laughs> oh, God. We're not. We, Bullshitting we yourself, embrace, Kevin. We embrace our, our non professional. Okay, let's try this again. Thank you. <sighs> Lots of luck. Thank you so much for being on the show today. And thank you to Robert Stanley for being with us. And thank you for listening. You can find us at leftofthevalley.com. You can find us on Facebook, on Twitter, at LETV. Uh, use five-star review where you find us. It helps others find the show. It helps us a lot, too. If you want to be one of our favorite, favorite listeners, like Freak Thinker 215, you can become a Patreon supporter. And you get extra ranty bits in the middle. Yes, absolutely. And you get some, <laughs> hopefully some nice little things we can actually send you away. Uh, and uh, so you can find us at the Patreon slash LETV. Okay, coming up. Let's see, what do we got coming up? Okay, so next week we'll be talking to our old friend Brent Lee. Yeah. Oh. On apologetics. I'm not exactly sure. I think we were, dis- we were supposed to discuss prophecy, but I think he wants to go somewhere else. So we'll, oh, we'll see. Fun. The week after that, we'll be talking to uh, Michael Sparks versus Jeremy Montanez. Oh my God, I'm oh, yeah. so That's going to be the old political this. match about yeah. Bernie Sanders. That's oh, going to be interesting. I, I am here for that. The week after, I am so excited. The week after that, we have Belief It or Not with Trevor Pullman. And then after that, we have the people of the Secular Soup with Amy oh, Withawi. Oh. And then we move into the Godless Revolution. I love that. <laughs> Godless Revolution. Uh, with Dan Ellis. And then after that, we move into September. Oh my gosh. There we, goes got, we got lots summer. of stuff coming yeah. up. We got uh, Evidence-Based Eating with Del Unneth. That's going to be interesting. Mm. And then, of course, we have The Vanishing of the Bee with Miriam Hyman. I'm excited for that. Me too. We'll also have... We'll be talking about the bees. Everyone's Agnostic with Marie... And we'll also have the Free Thought Pro- Prophet with James McGaffick. Hmm. And this is a September. Then we get into October. Oh, my God. You have so many scheduled already. Yes. Yeah. We got a skeptic guy to conspiracy with Mike Bowler. Ooh. And then we'll have the people from Ask an Atheist with Sam Mulvey. Huh. And then, of course, we have our Halloween special at the end of the month. I'm so so that's what we got planned so far. So we get till about wow. October. <sighs> Goodness gracious. Anything else we need to add to all this? Buy some fucking stamps and vote, some Americans. Stamps. What do you need stamps for? So that's that's why a lot of younger Americans didn't vote because they they don't know how to do stamps. Uh, what stamps? What do stamps have about? to do with that? Don't yep. you just go to the booth and mark a check? Or, no, no, for like mail-in mail in ballots. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah. Well, that's not for a year for them, so. Our election's going to be long gone before that happens. Oh, well, yeah, our election is... <laughs> we haven't even started our debates, and it's in, like, three months. <laughs> yeah, it's true. That's I true. don't even know who's running. <laughs> 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 All right. Thank you so oh, much, guys. We like to I'm, keep it short I sweet. just know I'm not voting conservative. No, and no should you. Until next time. I think I might vote NDP. I like NDP. <laughs> I'm an now let me take a second. Oh, so now you're going to be gone for the next couple of weeks, huh? Yeah, yeah. You sure I can't find a way to persuade you to stay? I've already got my flight ticket booked. Who's going to, who's going to do the another, another brilliant moment if you're not here? I asked Christina to do it. Oh, come on. She's going to be talking about puppies. What? Or climate change. She might find something good in there about puppies and another brilliant moment. You sure I can't persuade you to stay? Just yes. Like, oh, okay, fine. I have to go. Well, you know, we'll, we'll give you a proper send-off for sure. Okay. Uh, you mind stepping over here? This is, you know, don't mind the big red X. You mind stepping the, over here? The big red X? Oh, yeah, no, don't mind. Okay, <gasps> sure. No, Kristen, don't! 
Don't what? I'm gonna get you for this! Kevin, you can't keep catapulting people like this. <laughs> Something to be ashamed.